Book One, Part One of Herodotus's Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Histories, Volume One by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book One, Part One, Paragraphs One to Fifteen. This is the display of the inquiry of Herodotus of Halicarnassus, so that things done by man not be forgotten in time, and that great and marvellous deeds, some displayed by the Hellenes, some by the barbarians, not lose their glory, including among others what was the cause of their waging war on each other. The Persian learned men say that the Phoenicians were the cause of the dispute. These, they say, came to our seas from the sea which is called Red, and having settled in the country which they still occupy, at once began to make long voyages. Among other places to which they carried Egyptian and Assyrian merchandise, they came to Argos, which was at that time preeminent in every way among the people of what is now called Hellas. The Phoenicians came to Argos and set out their cargo, on the fifth or sixth day after their arrival, when their wares were almost all sold, many women came to the shore, and among them especially the daughter of the king, whose name was Io, according to Persians and Greeks alike, the daughter of Inachus. As these stood about the stern of the ship bargaining for the wares they liked, the Phoenicians incited one another to set upon them. Most of the women escaped, Io and others were seized and thrown into the ship, which then sailed away for Egypt. In this way, the Persians say, and not as the Greeks, was how Io came to Egypt, and this, according to them, was the first wrong that was done. Next, according to their story, some Greeks, they cannot say who, landed at Tyre in Phoenicia, and carried off the king's daughter Europa, these Greeks must, I suppose, have been Cretans. So far, then, the account between them was balanced. But after this, they say, it was the Greeks who were guilty of the second wrong. They sailed in a long ship to Aia, a city of the Colchians, and to the river Phasis. And when they had done the business for which they came, they carried off the king's daughter Medea. When the Colchian king sent a herald to demand reparation for the robbery and restitution of his daughter, the Greeks replied that, as they had been refused reparation for the abduction of the Argive Io, they would not make any to the Colchians. Then, they say, in the second generation after this, Alexandrus, son of Priam, who had heard this tale, decided to get himself a wife from Hellas by capture, for he was confident that he would not suffer punishment. So he carried off Helen. The Greeks first resolved to send messengers demanding that Helen be restored and atonement made for the seizure. But when this proposal was made, the Trojans pleaded the seizure of Medea and reminded the Greeks that they asked reparation from others, yet made none themselves, nor gave up the booty when asked. So far it was a matter of mere seizure on both sides. But after this, the Persians say, the Greeks were very much to blame, for they invaded Asia before the Persians attacked Europe. We think, they say, that it is unjust to carry women off, but to be anxious to avenge rape is foolish. Wise men take no notice of such things for plainly the women would never have been carried away had they not wanted it themselves. We of Asia did not deign to notice the seizure of our women, but the Greeks, for the sake of a Lacedaemonian woman, recruited a great armada, came to Asia, and destroyed the power of Priam. Ever since then we have regarded Greeks as our enemies. For the Persians claim Asia for their own and the foreign peoples that inhabit it. Europe and the Greek people, they considered to be separate from them. Such is the Persian account. In their opinion, it was the taking of Troy which began their hatred of the Greeks. 
but the Phoenicians do not tell the same story about Io as the Persians. They say that they did not carry her off to Egypt by force. She had intercourse in Argos with the captain of the ship. Then, finding herself pregnant, she was ashamed to have her parents know it, and so, lest they discover her condition, she sailed away with the Phoenicians of her own accord. These are the stories of the Persians and the Phoenicians. For my part, I shall not say that this or that story is true, but I shall identify the one who I myself know did the Greeks unjust deeds, and thus proceed with my history, and speak of small and great cities of men alike. For many states that were once great have now become small, and those that were great in my time were small before. Knowing therefore that human prosperity never continues in the same place, I shall mention both alike. Croesus was a Lydian by birth, son of Aliates, and sovereign of all the nations west of the river Halys, which flows from the south between Syria and Paphlagonia, and empties into the sea called Euxine. This Croesus was the first foreigner whom we know who subjugated some Greeks and took tribute from them, and won the friendship of others. The former being the Ionians, the Aeolians, and the Dorians of Asia, and the latter the Lacedaemonians. Before the reign of Croesus all Greeks were free, for the Cimmerian host which invaded Ionia before his time did not subjugate the cities, but raided and robbed them. Now the sovereign power that belonged to the descendants of Heracles fell to the family of Croesus, called the Myrmnidae, in the following way. Candoles, whom the Greeks call Merciless, was the ruler of Sardis. He was descended from Alcaeus, son of Heracles. Agron, son of Ninus, son of Belus, son of Alcaeus, was the first Heraclid king of Sardis, and Candoles, son of Merciless, was the last. The kings of this country, before Agron, were descendants of Lydus, son of Attis, from whom this whole Lydian district got its name. Before that it was called the land of the Mii. The Heraclidae, descendants of Heracles and a female slave of Iardanus, received the sovereignty from these and held it because of an oracle, and they reigned for twenty-two generations, or five hundred and five years, son succeeding father, down to Candoles, son of Mercus. This Candoles then fell in love with his own wife so much that he believed her to be by far the most beautiful woman in the world, and believing this he praised her beauty beyond measure to Gyges, son of Dasylus, who was his favourite among his bodyguard, for it was to Gyges that he entrusted all his most important secrets. After a little while, Candoles, doomed to misfortune, spoke to Gyges thus, Gyges, I do not think that you believe what I say about the beauty of my wife. Men trust their ears less than their eyes, so you must see her naked. Gyges protested loudly at this. Master, he said, what an unsound suggestion that I should see my mistress naked. When a woman's clothes come off, she dispenses with her modesty too. Men have long ago made wise rules from which one ought to learn. One of these is that one should mind one's own business. As for me, I believe that your queen is the most beautiful of all women, and I ask you not to ask of me what is lawless. Speaking thus, Gyges resisted, for he was afraid that some evil would come of it for him. But this was Candoles's answer. Courage, Gyges, do not be afraid of me, that I say this to test you, or of my wife, that you will have any harm from her. I will arrange it so that she shall never know that you have seen her. I will bring you into the chamber where she and I lie, and conceal you behind the open door. And after I have entered, my wife too will come to bed. There is a chair standing near the entrance of the room. On this she will lay each article of her clothing as she takes it off, and you will be able to look upon her at your leisure. Then, when she moves from the chair to the bed, turning her back on you, be careful she does not see you going out through the doorway. 
As Gyges could not escape, he consented. Candores, when he judged it to be time for bed, brought Gyges into the chamber. His wife followed presently, and when she had come in and was laying aside her garments, Gyges saw her. When she turned her back upon him to go to bed, he slipped from the room. The woman glimpsed him as he went out, and perceived what her husband had done. But though shamed, she did not cry out or let it be seen that she had perceived anything, for she meant to punish Candores, since among the Lydians and most of the foreign peoples it is felt as a great shame that even a man be seen naked. For the present she made no sign and kept quiet. But as soon as it was day she prepared those of her household whom she saw were most faithful to her, and called Gyges. He, supposing that she knew nothing of what had been done, answered the summons, for he was used to attending the queen whenever she summoned him. When Gyges came, the lady addressed him thus, Now, Gyges, you have two ways before you. Decide which you will follow. You must either kill Candores and take me and the throne of Lydia for your own, or be killed yourself now without more ado. That will prevent you from obeying all Candores' commands in the future and seeing what you should not see. One of you must die, either he, the contriver of this plot, or you, who have outraged all custom by looking on me uncovered. Gyges stood a while, astonished at this. Presently he begged her not to compel him to such a choice. But when he could not deter her, and saw that dire necessity was truly upon him either to kill his master or himself be killed by others, he chose his own life. Then he asked, Since you force me against my will to kill my master, I would like to know how we are to lay our hands on him. She replied, You shall come at him from the same place where he made you view me naked, attack him in his sleep. When they had prepared this plot and night had fallen, Gyges followed the woman into the chamber, for Gyges was not released, nor was there any means of deliverance, but either he or Candores must die. She gave him a dagger, and hid him behind the same door, and presently he stole out and killed Candores as he slept. Thus he made himself master of the king's wife and sovereignty, he is mentioned in the iambic verses of Archilochus of Paris, who lived about the same time. So he took possession of the sovereign power, and was confirmed in it by the Delphic oracle. For when the Lydians took exception to what was done to Candores, and took up arms, the faction of Gyges came to an agreement with the rest of the people, that if the oracle should ordain him king of the Lydians, then he would reign, but if not, then he would return the kingship to the Heraclidae. The oracle did so ordain, and Gyges thus became king. However, the Pythian priestess declared that the Heraclidae would have vengeance on Gyges' posterity in the fifth generation, an utterance to which the Lydians and their kings paid no regard until it was fulfilled. Thus the Myrmnidae robbed the Heraclidae of the sovereignty and took it for themselves. Having gotten it, Gyges sent many offerings to Delphi. There are very many silver offerings of his there, and besides the silver he dedicated a hoard of gold, among which six golden bowls are the offerings especially worthy of mention. These weigh thirty talents, and stand in the treasury of the Corinthians, although in truth it is not the treasury of the Corinthian people, but of Sipsilus, son of Eetion. This Gyges, then, was the first foreigner whom we know, who placed offerings at Delphi after the king of Phrygia, Midas, son of Gordias. For Midas too made an offering, namely the royal seat on which he sat to give judgment, and a marvellous seat it is. It is set in the same place as the bowls of Gyges. This gold, and the silver offered by Gyges, is called by the Delphians Gygean, after its dedicator. As soon as Gyges came to the throne, he too, like others, led an army into the lands of Miletus and Smyrna, 
and he took the city of Colophon. But as he did nothing else great in his reign of thirty-eight years, I shall say no more of him, and shall speak instead of Ardis, son of Gyges, who succeeded him. He took Priene and invaded the country of Miletus, and it was while he was monarch of Sardis that the Cimmerians, driven from their homes by the nomad Scythians, came into Asia and took Sardis, all but the Acropolis. End of Book One, Part One Recording by Graham Redmond